And Sven would sing at the top of his lungs <laughs> to every song. And he knew every song in that hymn. But he would sit there and sing it. And then I, one time I just said, oh, what the heck. <laughs> I'm singing with him. So every once in a while, a hymn comes up and I just feel like i got to do it. That's one of the first hymns I ever learned. I don't remember hymns from my childhood because I didn't pay attention in church. But that was one of the, the, the first hymns that, that I, I learned when Kay and I started going to church. Preach, um, <laughs> Stuart, you didn't preach on um, strongholds last week, did you? Yeah, they were, they were probably glad to get off that train. But, um, so, you know, what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to be in Matthew. We're going to be in the um, 15th chapter of Matthew. And, you know, I follow the lectionary most, most of the time. And... and Sometimes the lectionary just lines up. And you just got to go. Because people go, why do you use prescribed readings? And where's the Holy Spirit in that? Well, I can tell you, the Holy Spirit jumps in and prescribed reading. Because the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit wants to go. Yep, yes. And so you just can't, you can't make this stuff up. So we're baptizing today. And there is, and, and someone asked me something this week. And I get this question quite often. And I can relate to it. <coughs> Stuart, I know that you can relate, but when they gave you sacramental rights, that was a big deal, wasn't it? It's still a big deal. Um, to, to have the authority given to us, bestowed upon us by the, by the church, um, to baptize and to consecrate elements is um, it's humbling. It's, it's humbling. Not everybody gets to um, do do this, um, and like I told Harry a little while ago, we might we might get wet, but we're sitting behind. When we baptize today, we're sitting behind home plate at the World Series. Mm -hmm. You know, we're up front and center. If something's going to happen. I'm fully believing that something's going to happen. Not only are we just baptizing in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, baptizing in the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit fire. Something's going to happen. When she ex if she expects it, something will happen. When she comes up, some, something's going to change. It might not be, it may not manifest itself immediately, but something is, is going to change. We've seen the change already. Period. We've known it. You're not the only one in this church that, that's going through a change. You're not the only person. Lives are being changed in this church. Right now as we speak, lives are being changed. Lives are being saved through your prayers. So what we do and what, what, what's, what is happening here is of monumental importance. Um, and like I say, if anybody ever is ever being, the question I get is, I, I, I don't feel worthy. I don't feel worthy. And, and I can relate because if anybody in here should not feel worthy, it's me because I'm standing behind the pulpit in a beautiful building fixing to baptize a beautiful child of God and uh, to consecrate the elements, to, to become, if you, in Eucharist theology, um, says that it's not a whole Catholic practice. It doesn't become, but it becomes a representation and the, the Christ dwells in them. There's something, I preached on it last month, there's something that happens because of what we do here because of what Christ did there. Right? So something happens. When I, when I go through that, that ceremony and, and consecrate these, something happens. And, and it's, you can feel very unworthy to, to do that. And so um, it's never lost on me what uh, the responsibility that's been given to me and to uh, people like Stuart, the clergy. So um, I can relate to the, uh, the feeling of unworthiness. And I think we all can, and we all do at times. I get that quite a bit. Um, at certain times in um, people's life, usually after a confession of faith, a profession of faith, but, and you know, the, the first thing is, well, I am unworthy. I, I am unworthy. The, the Bible's clear on that, that in your present sinful state, you, you're, you're unworthy. You're, nothing that you do, the Bible's very clear, nothing that you do can bring you in right relationship with God. Amen? 
That sign sounds harsh, but that's just the fact of it. Because if you could, then you wouldn't need that. You understand? And nothing more can be done than that. So anytime, when we say we're unworthy, what, what, what that causes us to do is to try and create works. Because somehow we want to contribute to our own salvation. It's just human nature. We want to do something. And then we slide into some legalistic thing about servicing and stuff like that. And works. We should see works. Um, one thing I've always been um, not, not had a problem with was when people say you must be born again. I, I agree with that. But I was like, well, what does that look like? You can say I'm born again, but what does it look like? What is the fruit, you know? Um, and, and, and God wants to see some fruit for what he, what he purchased um, from you. And so um, we do need to see that. And so everybody needs to be born again. But in the scripture today, I want to address value. Amen? Value and worth. Because a lot of us, a lot of us see the worth in other people. We don't see the worth in ourselves. Amen? Y'all are down with that. That's, that's the truth. And you know, sometimes we, we, we can work and we can forgive other people, but we won't forgive ourselves. So there's an internal problem that we have. And sometimes it's the enormity of what Christ did. And if you've ever seen, uh, we don't do crucifixes, but in the Catholic Church, crucifix is a very, very big thing. It's, it's, you will have the suffering Jesus strapped to that cross. It's a very disturbing image. And so... It, Think I was not worthy for Jesus to suffer like that. But, but the scripture tells us differently. The scripture tells us differently. And we, but we assign value to everything. I looked this little statistic up. Tesla, does anybody know who Tesla is? The car company Tesla. Anybody know what a market cap is? What the value of something is? Market cap of a business is all the shares outstanding multiplied by the value of those shares at any given time. That's the market capitalization of that company. If everybody turned in their stocks, that's what they would have to pay those people. The market cap, Tesla is worth more than the largest auto manufacturers in the world, the top nine. Cumulatively, Tesla market capitalization is worth more than all nine of them combined. That's Toyota, Volkswagen, GM, all those. But yet, what do you think Tesla's market share is? Less than 1%. So there's a value there that just doesn't make sense. Right? And so valuation, what your, va your value or value of anything is only what somebody is willing to pay for it at any given moment. If nobody pays for it, guess what it's worth? Nothing. It sits there. But enough people see enough future in Tesla stock to trade it higher than all the other stocks combined. Amen? They would rather buy Tesla than all the nine for the same price. Only because somebody puts value on the future of that company, and their future is EVs, electronic vehicles, or electric vehicles. So there's speculation. Somebody sees value in it. And so we're talking about value and your value and your worthiness. To receive the Christ of God. And so in 15, the Bible, and this is the lectionary cross gospel reading today, and it's Luke 15. And we want to go right before, uh, because if you just pick up at 15, you miss a little something that sets a little, a, a little context. If salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is it is fit neither for soil nor for manure pile. They throw it away. And then these words, let anyone with ears to hear, hear. Amen? So he's, somebody, somebody's listening. And then we go on to 15 and we start a, a new chapter. And it says, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. Who had ears? The sinners and the tax collectors. Those on the outskirts. Those who were deemed 
had no value in society at that time. Jesus is speaking, and they're the ones that are listening. They're the ones with the ears to hear. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, and then grumbling, and that word grumbling in, in, in the Greek, and if, if you look at it, what the Hebrew is, that's the same word that they did as they were coming through the wilderness after they just got out of Egypt. And what they're grumbling, they're grumbling. And when they come out of Egypt, what are they grumbling about? And what does that grumbling um, person, not personify, what does it represent? It represents it. At the time, God has brought you out of Egypt, placed you in the, 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 the desert. You're, you're in the Exodus. You don't like it. And so you grumble. And what you're saying when you grumble is that you know more than God. Because your, your salvation path, your salvific path is not lining up with what you want. You think you know more than God. Or they think they know more than God. So the Pharisees, when they see Jesus sitting talking with the tax collectors and sinners, they grumble. They grumble. One thing, they, don't, they do not see the divinity of Jesus. They do not recognize the incarnation of, of Jesus as God himself. God incarnate. And so they grumble, and what they're saying is, this is not God. This man is of God because they've seen some stuff, right? So they know he's doing works and he's seeing, they're seeing things. They know he's of God. But now when they when he does something that doesn't make sense to them and goes against a thing, they go, well, then that's not of God. And they grumble. That's not of God. What's he doing there? A godly person doesn't do that. We thought he was godly until he did this. And now it's looking like he's not God. The fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Amen? He welcomes the sinners. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and he does what? Rejoice. He rejoices. He throws a party. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Amen? 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 Because he said you were, 
And he says, you are. Because when Jesus looks at something, he does not see the condition that it's in. He sees the condition that it can be restored to. Praise God. Hallelujah. And he continues to see the value in what no one else sees value in. Those who are not even aware they are lost, who are sinning against him, Christ died for them. The people that beat Christ beyond recognition, pounded nails through his feet and wrists, hung him on that cross, are the exact same people that he died for. It did not, what they did to him did not diminish their value to Jesus and to God. The purchaser declares the value. Yes. Don't you ever, ever forget that. Don't you ever wake up in the morning and not know that you are a valued possession of the Most High God who breathed and thought this into existence. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 There is nothing, that's why we declare healings and things, because there is nothing that that God can't do. Amen. And there is nothing that He is not willing to do. <clears throat> so, my word to you is your value has been established. The decision is yours whether you're going to live in it or deny it. But he has already said what your value is. God said it's an even trade. God said it's an even trade. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish. Have everlasting. See the beauty in the scriptures? The more you study them, the more you see the congruency and just the, 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 the beauty in it. I don't know how people miss that. Everybody has value. And it's established by God yes. through Jesus Christ. Amen. Get this, we get this debate in on uh, Eucharist too. Eucharist is just like yeah, that's just another word for it. Fancy word. Paid a lot of money to get to know like one of too. <laughs> You're made worthy, Jesus invites all to his table. Because he makes everyone love. I believe I have seen this, I have witnessed this one of the very first times um, I preached, we, we did communion. I didn't know much about it. I was not a pastor. I was just preaching. And we, we had communion. We walked. Everybody was starting to walk out. And then somebody said, hold on. Everybody come back in. We came back in. There was a young man there. He had never, he had been given the cup. And, and he was still sitting there holding it. His hands were shaking. And he came under conviction when he realized what that represented. And he received Christ right there on the spot. Ever since that day, I've treated this a lot better. I know the transformative power that there is in this sacrament. And so when you come to this table, come with expectation. And come with value that God sacrificed his son for you. And therefore you are Lord. You'll turn to page 12, okay?
peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess we are not left our We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your laws. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us with joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now, um, the great thanksgiving on page 13. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, and do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine that be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast in his heavenly banquet, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in 
good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strays, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. Amen. I just want you to know that God loves you so much. I don't. <clears throat> Let's just go. Okay? Or I'll go in the moment. 